Andre Freitas about uh, question answering of her linked data and big data. Andre is a PhD candidate at the Digital Enterprise Research Institute at the National University of Ireland and is a co-founder at Amtera Semantic Technology. His research areas include natural language processing, information retrieval, semantic web, big data, and linked data. He's author of several publications on a wide range of topics in semantic web, in particular vocabulary independent query and natural language query techniques over linked data. Thank you, Andre. So let me, let's see if it's better now. So thanks Pierre Paolo uh, and Piero uh, for the invitation. So the idea uh, to, of this presentation today is just to provide uh, for you a, a, a very comprehensive set of pointers uh, for this area. So uh, the information that I got is that the profile of the audience is quite uh, heterogeneous. So I just try to be more broad than depth. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, the goals for this talk, first, uh, the main motivation for that uh, is to understand uh, the changes on the database landscape that are just happening right now. Let's. So uh, the, the first motivation for this talk is first to understand uh, the main uh, changes in the database landscape that are just happening. This is what's called big data. And uh, big data has, brings uh, a, a very interesting opportunity for uh, question answering and semantic applications in both directions, uh, in the direction that they can help to address some of the challenges that bring, big data brings and in the other direction as well, that big data can help uh, semantic applications such as question answering systems to become more intelligent. So, and, and the idea of this talk is to provide you uh, the motivation and basically uh, what's happening uh, in this scenario and how, especially how question answering, which is a kind of a archetypical semantic system, how question answering fits into this new scenario. And as I already mentioned, uh, I'm prioritizing coverage over depth. Uh, so it should be a, a quite, let's say, broad uh, talk. And, but if you want any more details in some of the topics, just feel free to interrupt and ask. So the idea is to be more a conversation uh, than, a, a, let's say, a straight talk. So if you want, just feel free to interrupt. We have a lot of time. So basically the outline for this talk is uh, first we are going to start with the motivation and the context. Then uh, we are going to describe a little bit uh, of the big data landscape, especially how it relates to question answering systems. Uh, there is uh, one important question that needs to be answered first before going deep into QA is, are natural language interfaces uh, useful for databases? So not all uh, of the people uh, agree on that, but there are some uh, strong indicators that uh, they are extremely useful. Uh, I, I'm going to give you more details on that. Uh, then we are going to describe the basic concepts, uh, the anatomy of a simple question answering system. Uh, we are going to describe how we evaluate question answering systems, uh, then we, in general, and then we go uh, into more details on question answering systems over linked data. So existing systems uh, and also uh, we are going to, to provide more detail on one specific system called Troll, which is the system that uh, we developed at Derry. Uh, then uh, w one thing that uh, may be interesting for part of this audience uh, is having a collection of important resources uh, that I found, I, I found particularly useful. That's the session, Do It Yourself. And yeah, and then some roadmaps, so the topics uh, that are emerging as an important 
uh, important directions for this uh, area, question answering over leaked data. And then we are trying to generalize uh, from question answering systems uh, to semantic applications. So what we can learn from question answering systems uh, that we can embed in other domains of application. So if somebody is not interested exactly in QA, uh, yeah, this might uh, be an interesting part. So, and then we'll conclude uh, the takeaway message. So, in terms of the motivation, so question answering system is grounded on a very basic, simple principle that uh, our communication is heavily mediated by natural language, right? So, uh, it's a natural way for us to interact with people and then uh, it follows that it should be uh, at least a reasonable way for us to interact with systems. So, uh, what's question answering system? So, uh, how uh, we define question answering? Uh, first, uh, it's a research field of, on its own. So, uh, it's a large community. Uh, it's segmented, so it's not just uh, one research field. Some people focus on more on the computational linguistic aspects. Others focus on the let's say software engineering aspects. It's uh, heavily empirical, so uh, most uh, of the research that's done in this field uh, is done through the development of software artifacts, linguistic resources, and on the uh, experimental verification of the results. And uh, I believe the most interesting part is that it's heavily multidisciplinary. So uh, it covers natural language processing, information retrieval, databases, semantic web. And uh, this is good, so because Somehow, if you are in this field, you get exposed to all of these trends, and it forces you to have a multidisciplinary perspective uh, over computer science and over the problem, over semantics. Um, okay, the basic idea is quite simple. You have a question, which is your information need. Uh, you think that some uh, resources out there might contain uh, the answer for your question, could be text, could be databases, and then you have a system which will uh, look at the resources and match uh, the information in the resources with uh, your query, and in the end, we'll provide an answer. So we are going to use this query, uh, this question, as our question to walk through uh, the examples. So uh, there are some questions, uh, especially from people from other communities. Uh, about how useful uh, are question answering systems. It would seem for uh, a, a person just coming to the field that would be, of course, it's very useful. But if you go, for example, in the information retrieval community, uh, this is not perceived uh, as a, a very uh, factual uh, statement. So, uh, and then here uh, we are just providing a comparative uh, analysis of usually what's the difference between a keyword-based search and a question-answering system-based uh, search. So usually from the keyword perspective, keyword search perspective, the information retrieval uh, perspective, you, users usually uh, carry a lot of the interpretation effort of the data. So usually if they have a more complex information, need, they, they have to iterate uh, through uh, multiple search steps and then uh, navigate and then collect, start collecting information from uh, other, uh, from multiple resources sometimes. Uh, so it's uh, usually said that uh, information retrieval systems tend to be answer driven uh, information access in the sense that you try to replicate uh, the keywords which, in which your information is represented. So you're not asking a question, you're just trying to find the resources which are out there with the best uh, information that you have. And yeah, in terms of input and output, you are already quite familiar with that. Uh, so the difference between information retrieval and QA uh, could be summarized as uh, QA delegates more uh, of the interpretation effort to the machines, right? So we are expecting more from the machines in this case. Uh, it's a query-driven information access and uh, as I uh, already mentioned, you have a natural language query input, uh, which usually means 
uh, which you usually is good to uh, represent uh, more complex information needs. So if you have a very trivial query, such as uh, where someone uh, was born, or, or uh, that you can represent by the name of the person and then the place, or is someone from some place, uh, maybe a question answering is not uh, the ideal scenario for you, but it will address your query uh, anyway. So now if we contrast uh, with databases, so usually uh, the database community is much focused on relational databases, right? So a lot of the effort is about optimizing uh, algorithms for querying, query planning over relational databases. And uh, the scenario that we have, let's say, until a few years ago, is that databases uh, schema were somehow manageable. So you could have a, a quite large schema, but uh, these schemas were quite well behaved, quite well controlled. Uh, but this landscape is changing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more on the big data sesh on how uh, databases uh, are shifting in the direction of more complex databases. Uh, but usually when you talk about interaction with databases, you need to master uh, a structured query language, the syntax of a structured query language, and you need to understand uh, what's behind the schema of a, a database. So you need to understand the schema in order to build the query. Uh, and, and this implies that this schema should be relatively simple. Otherwise, it will take too much time for you to build that. So again, the same QA in QA you expect that the system will do uh, the interpretation for you and you delegate more to the system. So QA is a more demanding uh, scenario in both cases. So, and, uh, and the, the major practical thing is that uh, from a systems deployment perspective, uh, all of the three are very complementary, right? So usually you have information needs which are well satisfied by keyword search, by structured queries, and you have other information needs which are more complex, uh, which depends on, on, let's say, more distributed resources. And in this case, uh, QA can uh, work pretty well. So uh, I believe just to show you what's the vision. Computer, this is Lieutenant Commander Data. Please access all Starfleet command orders to starships, star bases, and colonies for the last six months. Working. So in this case, it's not a person, but it's a computer talk to a computer. Uh, but uh, it shows the vision, and it shows quite clearly uh, that's quite useful. So if you can do that for all of information, all of your information, it, it's quite useful. And the interesting thing is that uh, systems which were having based on search for areas are starting to, to uh, we start to get more concrete examples of systems which have some better question answering capabilities or are moving in the direction uh, of uh, QA systems. So Facebook Graph Search, it's, uh, it's not a full question answering system, but it has the level uh, of complexity in the query that you expect from, uh, from a QA system. Uh, IBM Watson, who is familiar? Who, who saw the Jeopardy challenge for IBM Watson? Okay. So yeah, IBM Watson probably today is the best uh, example of a system. So it's a very interesting demonstration. Uh, it doesn't address uh, all of the QA problems. So uh, this Jeopardy challenge has a very specific way to put the queries. But for those of you, Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city oh, mentioned in Joshua that. showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson, what is Jericho? Correct. So just uh, explaining, Watson is the, yeah, the machine competitor. This is a very popular game in the US uh, where basically they describe a quite complex answer and they expect in return some sort of entity. So a name or I describe yeah, the characteristics of a person and then Watson describes uh, 400 the same category. The name of the person. This mystery author and her archeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? 
Correct. Same category, 600. At the Old Divide Gorge in 1959, she and Hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus boisei skull. Listen. Watson, who is Mary Leakey. You're right. 800, same cat. So uh, it shows that these things are, are becoming reality. So in, uh, yeah, years ago, it would be uh, quite, I mean, science fiction. But again, Watson uh, doesn't address all the problems. And as you know, uh, Apple Siri as well is uh, another very successful example of a question answering system. Uh, but the architecture behind it uh, is not that, the whole architecture behind it is not that clear. So just to summarize uh, this point, so QA uh, is usually heavily associated with this effort of trying to make the machines more uh, able to understand or to interpret both the information needs and both uh, the information sources so that they are able to match together, each other together. And uh, basically uh, all QA information retrieval and databases will be uh, living together for a long time uh, until, of course, QA becomes mature enough to, to, to become, to ass assimilate the other two uh, fields. So uh, I try to split in sessions. If you have any comments or if you want to complement said or just raise your hand, in. okay? So uh, one important trend that uh, probably of you uh, have heard a lot is uh, big data. It's a quite vague term. Uh, yeah, and this has a lot to do with different people having different perspectives of uh, what's big data. And, but the basic idea of big data is that, okay, to have intelligent systems and to do more applications, more interesting stuff, we need to have a more, or we need to provide the systems a more complete uh, picture of the reality. So we need to collect more data and this is becoming easier because we have mobile phones, we have sensors uh, that are becoming progressively uh, more cheaper. But the point is, once we have all this data, how we manage uh, this kind of data. And basically that's uh, what's big data. And one interesting aspect of, of big data, usually big data is described by three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. So volume uh, is about the trivial thing about having huge uh, data sets. Uh, velocity, by the need to process these data sets quite quickly. And var variety, by having very heterogeneous data sources that need to be uh, somehow integrated, right? So, uh, but one of the most critical impacts that is heavily tied to uh, question answering systems is the, the growth in terms of the schema heterogeneity. So behind the database, uh, you have uh, the definitions uh, of attributes. So you have uh, basically a schema. And if you look uh, in the recent years, we evolved it uh, even inside organizational systems from, uh, let's say, hundreds uh, of attributes, database with hundreds of attributes, to databases with thousands and even millions of attributes. And uh, the problem uh, is not just that. The problem is that when you are, are living in this very heterogeneous schema environment, uh, it's not possible to have a single version of the reality. It's, uh, yeah, it's intrinsic uh, to the problem, to the semantics of the problem, that uh, different perspectives and views of the reality uh, should uh, live together. So you have a scenario where you have data which is uh, very ambiguous, usually vague, and yeah, most of the time uh, from let's say, the other perspective, inconsistent as well. Uh, but the interesting part is that uh, once the systems, uh, the data that we have were restricted by economical reasons to what we could put uh, into relational databases, and this is what we are calling a long tail of data. Basically, if you entered inside a company, you would have a customer's databases, billing databases, things that were very recurrent and, and very, regular, uh, but to move into this scenario where you have, you need to have a more complete, uh, let's say, picture of the reality, you need somehow to move in the direction of 
data which is not that regular, not that frequent, and basically you move to the long tail of data. So basically you have that dashed uh, line there which represents what we, we could have so far. And the idea is that once we move in the direction of the long tail, we'll have more semantics, more interesting applications, but a very hard data management problems. So, and, and this is, uh, so big data, the concept of big data is aligned uh, with another concept which is quite important in the database space, uh, which is called data space. So it, it was proposed by Franklin in 2005, which is the, uh, and there is a, a very interesting article that I recommend you to read. Uh, very informal, call it, uh, if you have too much data, then good enough is good enough. Basically, it's saying, okay, you cannot expect to have the same kind of precision to do the same kind of queries uh, with the volume and the complex of data that we have today. So, uh, and basically, uh, big data and data spaces uh, are passing very similar messages. So, first, uh, if you have very heterogeneous data, uh, they should coexist together. Maybe they do not need to be integrated. Uh, if you have too much data, you should expect semantic best effort queries, as you expect in any Google query. You shouldn't expect precise results. You should expect uh, that you have more work to, to, to manage that, but that's okay. And yeah, pay-as-you-go data integration, which basically means that you do not need to integrate everything. Uh, you just need... Uh, to somehow maybe query and integrate it as in a pay-as-you-go method, and yeah, and coexistent query and search servers. So you try to do a structured query, uh, you, you didn't get any results, so you try to search, you try to do QA, and this is aligned with the previous point that I, I said about coexisting uh, different mechanisms for having data access. And another uh, movement that's quite interesting uh, it's called NoSQL. So in terms of uh, concrete databases, uh, there are many platforms emerging today which are, are called uh, NoSQL, uh, which basically puts some flexibility into some constraints from the relational world. And, and these constraints basically gave the guarantee for previous databases, uh, some important guarantees for consistencies, for example. Uh, and this is a very important trend. So if you look at Facebook, or companies like Google, they are heavily based uh, on this kind of databases, NoSQL databases. And uh, there, there are four trends that uh, the CEO of Neo4j, which is a NoSQL based company as well, uh, set uh, for, for NoSQL databases. So first it is the database size. Uh, let me just move to the, sorry. which is quite clear that uh, the amount of data that we, we are having today uh, is growing exponentially, so this constraints that NoSQL platforms uh, flexibilize, uh, yeah, this, you have no other uh, way to manage the data. The other, uh, the other important trend that supports somehow NoSQL platforms is connectedness. So basically, you, if you have in this graph, you look at text documents, then you go to hypertext on the web with links, and then you move towards having more, let's say, structured data. But this structured data is very heterogeneous as well, and it's living together with the textual data. So uh, it's not an environment that looks uh, well-behaved, but it's a quite wild uh, environment that we have today. And the, the trends three and four are individualization of content. Now everybody can create content, uh, distributed content, and yeah, which is uh, basically trend for. And these are quite strong, especially if you are uh, operating on the web or yeah, in a very complex domain, these trends are, are, are quite important trends. So this is just to, to give you some references for different flavors of NoSQL platforms. Uh, somehow, I'm not going to, to detail that, but uh, it's important to be aware of that because uh, it's more, it's the kind of tool that everybody will have on their palette to design systems or to build systems. So, uh, and, but if you, if you somehow try to put them in a, in a graph to contextualize, usually you have on the left uh, 
platforms, databases, which cope well with volume, uh, but are less structured. And on the right, we have more structured databases, which somehow represent, are more expressive in representing the relations, uh, but uh, are, are less scalable, naturally. And yeah, basically, in the context of linked data, we are in the graph database. Uh, and in the context of query, this is the most challenging, uh, let's say, part of the graph, the graph database. So from now on, uh, we are going to talk a lot about graph databases, which basically is linked data that probably you saw yesterday. Uh, this much here. So as I uh, already mentioned, uh, in big data is usually defined as volume, velocity, and variety. Variety somehow uh, is neglected. Uh, the reason behind that is that usually vendors and yeah, uh, database uh, people have good solutions or relatively good solutions for volume and velocity, but variety is the, is the ugly kid that nobody wants to, to make too explicit. But it's the most interesting part because there, uh, by using some principled uh, semantic approach, uh, yeah, basically addressing variety demands uh, a more drastic change in what we are doing now. So uh, now shifting a little bit towards linked data. Uh, linked data is big data. Uh, so depending on the context, may not be uh, big data from the perspective of volume, but certainly it is from the perspective of variety. So uh, it's very common to have a data set with uh, tens of thousands of different attributes, a very sparse uh, data graph that you need to manage to query to find information in that graph. Uh, yeah, basically uh, a linked data graph, probably you already uh, had that part uh, yesterday, is a composition of entry t attribute values, so triples. Very simple to, to understand what's inside a, a big data base. And yeah, it's heavily based on, uh, on web standards. So yeah, not going to too much details on that. There's the famous linked data cloud that everybody shows when talks about linked data. So, but the problem is that uh, in this scenario, we still have the, the main tool that we have to query, for example, very heterogeneous data sets like linked data sets uh, is structured queries. So Sparkle queries, there's a SQL query screenshot and as I previously mentioned, when you grow in the number of attributes, uh, your query construction time grows drastically. And uh, the problem is that if we put uh, existing tools that we have to have access to the data inside databases, we have in the one end of the spectrum structured queries, right, the traditional way to query, which provides quite good expressivity, but very poor usability. So you cannot quickly build a structured query uh, if you are not aware of the schema behind the database. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can apply simple keyword search over that, which provides a very high usability uh, solution, but usually you cannot query relationships in the data quickly using this approach. You need to understand the schema if you're using a simple keyword-based search. And in the middle of the spectrum, uh, we have other approaches which somehow uh, fail or address less expressivity or more usability. And ideally, what we want uh, is both high expressivity and high usability. So we want to break uh, this trade-off, right? So, and QA uh, for linked data can provide this uh, query mechanism, this kind of approach. So using our example query, uh, the problem is uh, what we can define as a vocabulary problem for databases. So the user have an information need, uses his own vocabulary to express his information needs, but he doesn't know how the data is represented inside the database. So these are examples of possible representations for the data. And in none of these cases, you have a, a perfect matching uh, for the database, for, for the user information needs. So for example, daughter in the first graph maps to child, in the second graph maps to father of, and yeah, in the other graph maps to number of kids. So uh, somehow you need to provide a principled interpretation to lift uh, this representation or to match the two together 
uh, to satisfy the, the user information needs. And that's what you're calling a semantic gap. And the process of addressing the semantic gap is what's called a schema agnostic queries. So users can be abstracted from the schema. But the problems with that is that we need somehow to establish the semantic equivalence uh, between uh, what's being asked uh, and the, the information that's expressed in the graph. And, there, uh, and to address that, you, maybe uh, the information that's expressed in the database is not in the same abstraction level, it's not using uh, the same uh, lexical e expression uh, of the words, and it, it doesn't have the same structure. Yeah, and, and yeah, there, there is an interesting work uh, by Popescu which defines this process uh, of having queries which can be easily mapped to database elements as semantically tractable queries. So it's, uh, but usually what they, they call uh, semantically tractable queries are, are queries we do not have, which have the same vocabulary. And this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is a trivial solution. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there is one challenge that QA can address uh, over big data, but also big data can uh, provide some uh, important input for uh, QA systems, especially uh, with regards to having distributional semantics models which can support uh, the process of crossing the semantic gap, as you uh, already uh, saw early today. So just to summarize the session, so uh, schema size and heterogeneity is a major shift in the database landscape. Uh, basically, if we do not do anything or any, if we do not try to find any more principled solution for that, uh, we're not going to address the information. Uh, we are not going to address uh, the major challenge and we are not going to have the benefit of having large data sets. Uh, and QA in particular and natural language interface uh, can work uh, are somehow advanced in the discussion of having a principled uh, approach to provide uh, schema agnostic queries, so queries which crosses this vocabulary gap. Okay, so questions, comments, disagreements? Okay, so one important question uh, that somehow needs to be experimentally verified is, uh, okay, you're talking, it makes sense in this vague way, but are our natural language interface really uh, useful for users? So what we are defining as natural language interfaces somehow uh, is a superset which contains question answering systems. So why in question answering systems you expect, let's say, more uh, direct answers. In natural language interface, you can have, for example, uh, an output which is a document or a text snippet or, or something or database records, raw database records. Uh, and I believe the question is more if uh, from the user perspectives, it, it really necessary to have natural language interface. And uh, there is a, a very interesting comparative study uh, by Steck Kaufman and Abraham Bernstein uh, which compared different uh, interfaces, four different interfaces, uh, three natural language interfaces and one visual uh, query system where you have a kind of graph tool that you can build your query. And they want to find if the users preferred really the natural language interface or the most, let's say, advanced QA interface. So the systems that they evaluated, the first system was NLP Reduce, which is a, it's a natural language interface, so you can type what you want there, but uh, it works much more as a search engine. So it's, uh, yeah, it has a very simple uh, inverted index uh, and you do a very simple bag of words approach to address the query with some simple uh, word net based uh, query expansion. Then they have queries with some more complex QA system where they have somehow an interaction with the user having clarification dialogues at any point that they had ambiguity, for example, they have a more sophisticated approach. They, they parse the query, they try to match the structure in the query uh, with the structure uh, in the data. 
uh, and they have this other approach called ginseng, where they build a, gram uh, a grammar uh, from, from the data, and then they provide the users a uh, suggestion based on the grammar. And they have semantic crystal, which is the kind of baseline. It's a visual query interface, not a natural language query interface. So yeah, these are examples of screenshots. So NLP reduce. Querix, which is the most advanced uh, from the uh, natural language perspective. This is the ginseng. It's a controlled natural language. So you cannot put whatever you want to just type what the autocomplete permits. And then you have the graphical, which is not natural language. And uh, so to evaluate this, they used uh, 48 subjects, quite comprehensive areas uh, of work and ages. They used four questions, uh, which I believe is the main limitation of their uh, study. Uh, and they evaluated in terms of query performance metrics uh, and system usability scale, which is the default uh, user uh, interface evaluation approach. And they used a very simple data set as well, which I believe is the second limitation of this study. But it's a very good first study, very principled uh, first study. And what they found is that from the perspective of the query performance, so query uh, performance performs quite well. So the most advanced uh, natural language interface uh, comparatively with the others works quite well. And from the uh, usability study, uh, also queries, queries uh, wins. Uh, so far, this is the most, let's say, advanced uh, and more principled uh, study done in this area. And I believe the results are quite uh, positive in the direction of natural language interface being a useful mechanism for, for uh, people to interact with databases. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the possible interpretations that they had uh, for people liking, in the end, people like it a lot using natural language uh, interfaces uh, in even more, let's say, more sophisticated natural language interfaces. And yeah, the possible interpretation for that is that it's a natural way to do that. Uh, people do not need to think a lot in order to ask a query. And you can provide a more complete description of all your information needs instead of trying to find a strategy, a search strategy, uh, to address your information needs. So yeah, this basically is the motivational part covered. So, Pier Paolo, are you controlling the time, or Pier? <laughs> I can. How? Uh, just. Perfect. So, any questions so far? Comments? I have one. Okay. And it's about the user study. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I can agree with you that four questions probably are just um, too few, uh, but the, the experiments show that um, I was expecting more people should like like a visual approach for for uh, building queries and things like that. But this is not really the case. And uh, from, a, from the other point of view, I would have also thought that uh, people would have liked the, the complete freedom of uh, like normal search engine, say like, like something like that. But the way in between is, is probably the best, the, 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 the best way. And uh, I cannot really figure it out. It, it, it seems to me that it's not that intuitive. And w do you have some ideas about that? Wh why, in, in, your, in your opinion, is, is, it is like that? I mean, uh, one important point uh, is that they used a very simple database to do the user studies. So the question answering system behaved quite well, behaved quite well. So if you consider this scenario, it's the ideal scenario somehow, right? If you have uh, a perfect or, let's say, a, a good performing uh, question answering system that can address uh, it's the most uh, natural way, especially if you're not from uh, computer science. So they, they explore different age ranges, different area ranges. Usually these studies are done with computer science stu stud students, but they, yeah, they, they 
had journalists, uh, historians. And so from this perspective, I believe this uh, yeah, points in the direction of having a more uh, intuitive interface. And, uh, and also uh, addressing the queries that they posed there, they defined it there, uh, yeah, demanded keyword searches was not the best way to address these queries. So usually people are familiarized with keyword search uh, from the perspective of document search, right? But not from the database search. So probably the user experience really pointed in the direction uh, yeah, of having. But if you have a very complex database, for example, yeah, probably the results would be uh, different. So instead of the Tang and Mumi, which is a, a very simple data set uh, with a lot of instances, but uh, yeah, very simple schema, they had DBpedia. Uh, yeah, you would need to have a more robust uh, query interface to support that, QA interface support that. And in terms of time, yeah, the construction with the visual query interface gives more control, but the time, let's just, yeah, it's, so cement crystal, yeah, it's twice. Perfect. Any other question? Do you know if a similar study has been done on uh, search engine on the natural on the normal web? Because, okay, um, I wonder if, since. Uh, also, people on the web usually use just some keywords. They don't address a query like a natural language query. I want you to know if uh, there is also a similar study on search engines. So, uh, I'm trying to... So, there is one way to see your question, mm -hmm. which is there are similar to address a query like uh, two or three keywords. But maybe if uh, this kind of paradigm uh, has not uh, arisen in the past, now people would use a search engine like uh, a natural language uh, search engine, you know? So I was just wondering if uh, some kind of uh, comparative has been done on, uh, on search engines. Okay. Uh, it's just a curiosity, however. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I'm posing you this question because a um, couple of days ago I wanted to use a knowledge graph on uh, Google and uh, so I posed, uh, I made a kind of natural language question. I didn't get uh, any results. Uh, my question was, uh, uh, can you give me the list of uh, movies from uh, Julia Roberts? Nothing. Uh, then I just uh, put uh, three keywords, uh, movies, uh, Julia Roberts, and I got uh, the answer from Wikipedia. So <laughs> um, that was quite strange, but uh, yes, that's the, mm, the way the web is supposed to answer when you put some keywords now. But I, I wanted it to go toward the natural language uh, formulation of queries. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Of the search engine, yeah. 
uh, that, yeah, somehow they, they, Google is very conservative in trying to put new features because it impacts a lot, everything on them. Uh, but certainly, uh, if you look at the interviews for the main uh, Google graph, knowledge graph, uh, let's say, uh, director, uh, yeah, he certainly is aiming at the direction of having uh, natural, full natural language queries over the knowledge graph. So that's what really, it's a Im very important, uh, let's say, sector inside Google, and it gets a lot of attention, but the point is that it takes a lot of time for them to, to put these features at a stage that they can become robust and, let's say, uh, web scale usable, usable at a web scale. Uh, but but you, your question also points in direction uh, which is interesting. It's why they didn't make keyword search more explicit in this user study. Uh, but from the point of view, for simple queries, uh, 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 queries which can be like the one that you mentioned, films by Julia Roberts or Ju Julia Roberts movies, uh, this can be satisfied both by a more complex, let's say, QA-like query and by a keyword-like query. But there are some queries, uh, I'll show some examples, even this uh, daughter of Bill Clinton query, uh, which are not, uh, I mean, equivalent from the search perspective. So it depends more on, on a, let's say, more principle matching with the data, with the structure of the data, a more principal interpretation uh, of the query, so some kind of syntax analysis uh, of the query. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay, so um, one important part, uh, one thing that I, I decided uh, for this specific talk uh, was to give you the basic concepts that everybody needs to, to have to build a QA system. So what I consider as a goal here is uh, to enable you to, if you want to start studying or researching or building QA systems tomorrow, you would not fall into the mistakes of, of trying to reinvent something that was there. And, uh, and, and for this, it's very important to, to somehow map the territory. So uh, there, is a, a, there are very detailed, let's say, taxonomies for uh, QA systems. So uh, I'm just going to move through that fast. So the first one is uh, what we understand as a query phrase. So basically, it's an indicator in the query that we can use to somehow point to what's being asked. So if it's a who query, we, we have uh, the indication that just we are looking for a person. If it's where, it's a place. And if we have, uh, let's say, WH words uh, followed by some additional nouns, adjectives, uh, we have additional information, so which party. And these are very simple things, but uh, when you're building QA systems uh, in Prex, uh, these are very useful. So this makes a, a, a huge difference trying to identify these patterns. And yeah, and question phrases gives very simple but very uh, important in indicators. So uh, another, uh, let's say, dimension or taxonomy which is important for uh, question answering systems are uh, the question types. Uh, usually you can make these question types taxonomies as much complicated as possible so you can really grow in, in complexity and depth in these taxonomies. But basically uh, we have usually this uh, agreed, let's say, higher level classes for, for queries. So we can have factoid queries, such as who is the wife of Barack Obama, uh, based on we have a list queries, give me all cities obeying this criteria. Uh, we have de definition queries. Uh, we have queries which explicit, make explicit the relationship between two entities, for example. Uh, yeah, superlative queries, yes, no queries, queries which the answer is yes or no, opinions queries, cause and effect queries, and this can be made uh, quite complex. So uh, this is usually uh, use it to define somehow the scope. So if you're evaluating a system and using, let's say, a query set, you need to define the scope of your query set, so the nature of that. But uh, 
uh, from at least from my perspective, uh, these are not, uh, let's say, perfect taxonomies or, or perfect classification systems for that, but gives a, a, a good starting point. So answer type uh, is the type of entity or answer that you're looking for a query that can be mapped uh, from your question phrase. Uh, there are more, let's say, detailed links. I'll leave the slides uh, on slide share so that you can take the pointers afterwards. Basically, it's the mapping from the question phrase to the type uh, of entity. Um, another terminology based concept is question focus. So usually it gives you the indication uh, of the property and the entity that you have in the query. So for example, yeah, what color? So what's, I'm looking for some uh, property if I'm thinking about a database or a graph uh, which expressed as color. And question topic which somehow uh, gives the higher level area that the query uh, addresses. Uh, in, from the point of view of data sources, we can have data sources with different structured levels. So going from structured data to semi-structured data to free text. We can have single data sources, multiple data sources, or web scale data sources. So uh, again, this is very important uh, first for you. If you start to, to develop an approach, to have this approach very well scoped. So, uh, and you need to define this uh, a priori uh, so that you do not try to solve everything, or all the dimensions of the problem together. So it's very important that from the start, okay, I'm going to address factoid queries uh, on single data sources for structured data. And this gives you the value of your contribution and makes it comparable to others. Uh, you, but uh, despite the fact that this is very well established, usually this scope is not well defined. Usually if you have uh, papers, uh, usually this is not clarified from the start. So uh, according to the domain, we can have yeah, open domain uh, queries, so queries which do not have any uh, specific domain or very specific domains such as, let's say, biomedical queries over biomedical corpora or, or over biomedical data. And data type, so which is related to the level of structure, different queries over text, over image, features extracted from image, features extracted for sounds and video, and multimodal QA, which basically uh, yeah, takes uh, different data types and, and put them uh, and merge them into a single model. And yeah, and answer formats, long answers, short answers, exact answers. So, Pierre-Paul, maybe it's a good point to, to stop. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So let's have a short break. Uh, Ten minutes. Or perfect. If there are any questions at this point, please ask them, or we can just go to the break. Okay. Let's break. So, uh, welcome back. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, almost finishing the basic concepts and the basic, yeah, uh, that are used uh, for, for QA systems. So one, one important aspect uh, is always evaluation. That's the, uh, how you can make your claims. Uh, so uh, when you're defining a test collection, and we are going to talk a little bit about evaluation. Uh, you need to define uh, some uh, categories to evaluate the quality of uh, the answer of your system. So, uh, and these categories are, are a quite good uh, way to, to organize this. So, the first is relevance. That's the main, most of the evaluations focus on, on uh, how relevant is the answer to, to your question. Now we are talking about the answer. 
uh, we have correctness, so if the answer is uh, correct or, or not. Uh, conciseness, uh, which is if the answer doesn't have extra information that the user doesn't need. Uh, completeness, uh, if the answer uh, have all the information that user needs. Uh, simplicity, uh, which uh, could be confused with conciseness, but uh, it's much more on uh, if the user can interpret the output. So the information, the answer is there, but you need somehow uh, to provide, to sh display it in, in a simple way that you can uh, facilitate uh, the interpretation of the information. And then justification, which uh, usually is not, uh, uh, let's say, a priority in terms of question answering systems, but this will become, tend to become more important. So if you have an answer, so give me yeah, what's the highest, uh, something GDP, uh, and you found weird the answer, you got a country that you were not expecting, somehow you need a way to, to go back to the data and, and say, okay, that's why uh, the system can justify, that's why I, I answered like this. So, yeah, in terms of answer assessment, so from the annotator perspective, uh, the, the annotator can use these categories right and exact, unsupported, and wrong. So it's a quite straightforward. Unsupported is the most uh, unclear. So basically unsupported is if you do not have a justification, if you, if you have uh, an answer, but you can provide the why in case the user asks. So, uh, the most trivial uh, question answering systems are search mechanism, which somehow use information uh, that was extracted from the queries, right, to, to improve the search process. Uh, but, some, but you have a spectrum. So uh, while most, uh, inf most uh, QA systems are uh, based on, on simple extraction, or you can address a lot of the information needs just by searching somehow by keywords or by doing a semantic search and then extracting what's called a passage retrieval, extracting parts of the documents uh, or data records from your database. You can also think about, about more sophisticated approach to process the answer. So uh, some answers may depend, for example, on the combination of input from different data sources, so your answer is not answerable by just uh, looking into a document or in one database. You need to combine uh, different databases uh, or even structured data together with unstructured data. Somehow you need to process that. Maybe you can do some reasoning. And yeah, that's the category that we are calling combination here. And uh, in the evaluation of question answering system, somehow this category is underrepresented because the, it's very time consuming to actually uh, try to define, let's say, questions which fall into this scenario because you need to build this scenario, right, uh, to evaluate that. So somehow uh, they are there, so you can evaluate them, but uh, they are underrepresented. Uh, a lot of the QA, let's say, tasks are simple extraction or can be addressed by simple extraction. So we have summarization where we need to somehow reduce uh, the, to generate a summary uh, of, of the data. So you cannot output the whole text or, or uh, you need to summarize that. You have uh, operational and functional queries. So if you think about get me the highest mountain uh, on earth, uh, you need, you, Maybe you have this information in a database saying Mount Everest is the highest mountain, but it's very likely, especially if you're thinking about the database that you have uh, a class called mountain, and, it, uh, and then you have associated a lot of instances, so Mount Everest, K2, and other mountains, uh, yeah, with different heights, and then you need to process that, so you need to do an operational 
uh, or functional processing of that, so sorting it, uh, getting the topmost, and so on. And also, uh, yeah, you can use some reasoning, and, and by reasoning, there is no limit. And this is also a very underrepresented category, so uh, queries which are dependent on uh, deductive reasoning, uh, abductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. And uh, this is a, a very interesting part of QA, but somehow is it still out of QA. So uh, we have domain experts in, in these areas, but this is not already fully transport to the question answering domain. But certainly it's one of the most interesting directions to, to investigate. Uh, okay, this is just probably the last categorization, uh, which uh, in regard to the complexity of question answering tasks, which is somehow related to the, the previous slides. Uh, so the first one uh, is called what's called semantic tractability. And uh, it's not a good expression to describe it, but we are using, uh, because it's a very popular uh, yeah, description. Basically, uh, if you look, for example, from the perspective of database, what's called a semantically uh, tractable query is a query which has the same vocabulary of the database. So the user somehow uh, discovered that the database has uh, this information there with the exact keywords that they are using. So this is a semantically tractable query, uh, which is not realistic. Uh, another uh, complexity criteria is related to answer locality. So this idea of having very local in one document, one database versus spread, uh, let's say, answer indicators, or let's say partial answers for your final answer. Another uh, is derivability, which is related to reasoning. So how far or what are the processes that we need to employ to derive uh, our answer. So it's not direct, it's not just a matter of extracting and combining. We need to do some uh, sort of transformation and reasoning over that. Uh, and then we have semantic complexity, which is related to the ambiguity, vagueness of the uh, data, of the uh, unstructured text. So if you look at, I mean, from the high level perspective of the components of a question answering system, uh, you have a question entering into a question analysis module, which basically is going to try to extract as much information as it can uh, from the question. So basically it's going to do a feature extraction based on that categories. Uh, uh, and we'll process the answer, for example, doing uh, a parsing. <coughs> Of the, of the question, uh, then there is expressed as just keyword query, uh, but I would say that it can be more, of course, more complex than that, but basically it will try to have a search process that uh, <coughs> will look into the web, a corpora or a database, uh, and try to extract what's called some passages, so passage retrieval, so basically possible uh, excerpts of interest from your whole data uh, corpora, right? And after that is done, basically uh, also there is not just answer type, it can be other features. So these additional features of the query which were extracted by question analysis are, uh, let's say, sent to the answer extraction module which will basically take the passages and process that more deeply. So. Uh, this is a common, uh, let's say, architecture for very simple question answering systems. It's good to, to organize our stuff, but uh, there are other approaches. So you can process this information, uh, you can do a semantic pre-processing of this information, which is not explicitly uh, there, somehow is there, uh, the indexing part or the semantic pre-processing. Uh, and you can have uh, a much more, let's say, you can have different approaches even in this high level description. Description. So, any questions so far? Okay. Questions? No. Okay, so uh, especially if you are both 
if you are in the scientific community, but also if you are, if you have a company or if you want just to build your own QA system for fun, uh, it's good to have a claim on what your system is good at, and it's very important to, it's fundamental to evaluate the system. And the good news is that uh, there are existing uh, evaluation campaigns for that. So, so far I have been focused, somehow I tried to generate a more generic discourse where it was not clear in this basic concepts if the uh, data behind uh, that you want to search was database records or if it was uh, text documents. Uh, but now, just to, to not let's explode the presentation with the slides, I'm just going to focus on the database part. Uh, and in particular, afterwards, on the linked data part. So to have uh, an evaluation of your system, you need three things. You need questions, you need uh, data sets, so where the information is located, and you need the answers. So, and the questions and the answers need to be generated in such a way that somehow it's representative of your problem. So you cannot just come up by yourself with some. You can do that for some base text, basic uh, yeah, tests, but uh, you need somehow to have uh, a representative sample of the society, uh, of the domains that may be interesting for all the people, and of different query features that different people may be interested on that. So that's the reason why usually these resources are community built. So uh, usually it's not one person, never is one person. And they can be very expensive to generate. So uh, yeah, track probably costs, which is the main evaluation in information retrieval, probably costs, yeah, millions of dollars, probably 10 millions. There was some, do, do you remember? Pierre was there uh, at CIGAR. Uh, I believe they, they had some number on, an, an estimate on how track, what's the cost of track? Uh, not, not for QA, but the whole track campaign, so for, Track is an evaluation campaign with many different uh, segments, but you, you didn't hear that. Okay, okay. So, and then after we have this test collection, we need some evaluation measures, which everybody's going to comply with, uh, that somehow is going to provide some indicator on, on uh, what you need. So, just starting by the evaluation measures, uh, the first measure, uh, quite popular measure, is recall. So the idea behind this measure is to have a statistical measure that says how complete is your answer set. So in the end, you run your experiments, you ask it, let's say, 100 queries, and you, you want to have a number saying, okay, uh, I, I, my system provided answers which were quite complete, or compared to other systems, uh, these answers uh, were something percent uh, superior in terms of completeness. And you define the recall by the number of correct system answers, by the number of gold standard answers. So suppose you have the query, uh, which are the Jovian planets in the solar system? And uh, on the right, you have the gold standard, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. And then you have the answers of your system, Mercury, Jupiter, uh, and Saturn. So some answers are missing, and that's what recall is being penalized at. Very simple measure to compute. <clears throat> now, uh, precision uh, will measure uh, how accurate uh, is your answer set. So if you're not returning something that uh, you shouldn't return. So in this case, uh, mercury is the something that you are not, uh, that you shouldn't return. And, oh, there is precision, sorry. Uh, instead of recall. And recall basically is taking into account uh, the number of answers that were correct by the overall number of answers that it returned. And there uh, should be precision. Basically, yeah. And then we have uh, mean reciprocal rank. Because somehow we measured the whole uh, answer set, right? Uh, but we didn't penalize in terms of ranking. Right? Uh, even uh, yeah, QA somehow focus on direct answers, but uh, QA is not always precise, and the ranking in QA, in question answering, makes sense. So somehow 
but in information uh, retrieval systems, definitely makes sense. So re reciprocal rank is a measure uh, of the ranking uh, quality. So if you have a system, so in this case, uh, reciprocal rank is defined as the first position of the relevant term. So if my ranking is like this, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Jap uh, Jupiter is the most, is the first relevant uh, answer, but it's on the second position. So reciprocal rank is uh, the inverse of the ranking number, the ranking index. So the reciprocal rank for this question is 0 0.5. Very simple uh, measure to compute. And mean reciprocal rank, basically you are computing for your whole query set. Um, I'm not going to enter into details of this, but basically uh, if you have different precision numbers for your query set, uh, you have different ways to average uh, that. And this is one uh, common uh, way, which is mean average interpolated uh, precision. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just leaving here as a pointer. Uh, I'll just go through that and the next measure as well, which is the normalized uh, discounted cumulative gain. So uh, if you look at the campaigns for question answering systems, most of them will not, will just take precision recall and mean, not even mean reciprocal rank. Yeah, just precision and recall. Uh, but information retrieval systems are involved in the direction of more sophisticated measures. And NDCG is an important one. We try somehow to, to summarize uh, precision and uh, mean reciprocal rank together. So to penalize uh, poor ranking positions uh, into, into a single measure on the precision as well. But I'll just leave it as a pointer. So in terms of uh, test collections, uh, as I said, it's very painful and uh, it needs, it's very expensive because you cannot build by yourself, you need other people to build that, to build test collection. So in terms of question answering for linked data, I'm just focusing on that because there are, of course, other test collections for question answering over textual data. Uh, these are the important question, uh, test collections. So the first one, in my opinion, is the most important because of its adoption, but the other ones are, are complementary and, and they are growing. Uh, and the last one, SEM search, is more on semantic search. It's a quite popular, uh, but I'll describe semantic search later, which somehow it's inside uh, the QA problem. So for called question answering over linked data challenge. So the first called campaign was held uh, at uh, European, now called extended semantic web conference in 2011. Uh, and it has uh, two data sets as data sources. The first is DBpedia, second is Music Brains. And it has uh, 50 questions uh, for training, 50 for test for both data sets. And yeah, I, I'm providing the URI. So this uh, data sets, uh, this test collection is quite good. So usually if you look at the, the file that you use to evaluate your system, it will look like this. So on the top, you have the natural language query, which caves have more than 100 entrances. Then you have the Sparkle query, which uh, enables you to fetch uh, the, the actual results from the database, and this is, was manually created, and then you have the, the entities or the post-process answer that you, that, you want to, uh, that you expect to get from the system. So very easy to process, uh, very straightforward. And these are examples uh, of some of the queries. They, they, they have a uh, varying number of features, so they address uh, different types of database operations. So yeah, uh, it's a quite, good test collection. So uh, then uh, they, in the next year, they created the question answer over linked data version two. Basically, uh, yeah, uh, increasing the number of questions in 50 for each data set and using the previous version for uh, S training data. 
So in terms of query features, there was uh, not a lot of variations, but they provided some covered. Uh, so this data set was harder to break, especially because uh, from some what we call uh, some compositional uh, aspects. So uh, we have, for example, some classes. If you look at the data set inside data set, which are uh, so for example, give me all European cities which have um, which hosted the Summer Olympic Games. Uh, you may have this expressed as one uh, class inside database, European cities which hosted the European game, or this can be split uh, as in that diagram that I have different representations for a data into different properties. So somehow you need a, a principled way to do the semantic matching bit or, or, and to cover all the possibilities. And this data set was exploring a little bit more this type of queries. And yeah, this was expressed in the numbers uh, for the evaluated systems. And then uh, in the third and last campaign, they are going to explore, they, they explored multilingual question answering system. So basically uh, you have input languages, different uh, input languages, English, Spanish, German. Uh, yeah, and you need to query the information in English, for example. Uh, and they al also have another challenge which is not directly related to question answering, but indirectly, which is called ontology lexicalization. Basically, uh, trying to uh, do some NLP operations and annotate ontologies with some NLP features. Uh, this can be used as an artifact for, for question answering system, but uh, it's, yeah, it's not related. Basically, the organizers are, are very uh, yeah, aligned to this area. And also, they will have next year called four, uh, which will try to merge structured data, linked data, with uh, unstructured text. So probably this is going to be the change there. So they are trying to merge uh, the two in the same scenario. You can compete. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I believe that yeah, we'll discuss more about this now, yeah, later. So uh, there is uh, the INEX linked data track. Uh, which has two tasks. Uh, one is more on keyword search over uh, linked data, cement search over linked data, uh, which is the ad hoc task. Uh, and uh, they have the Geopardy task as well, which is interesting because they, they took uh, questions from the Geopardy challenge and yeah, the systems are evaluated in terms of the, the test for the Geopardy challenge. And the, the, the challenge that uh, I showed uh, the video before. Um, yeah, I don't know too much about the popularity of this, but the other is considered, considered the de facto standard. And for the Geopardy task, they are already mixing linked data uh, with uh, unstructured data with Wikipedia. So basically, it's the data sources are DBpedia, Yago, uh, Wikipedia. Yago is a, is a data set which is based on the link structure uh, of Wikipedia. So this is one uh, example of uh, an INX query of the Geopardy challenge. German politicians, uh, which German politician is a successor of other, another politician who stepped down before his or her actual term was over and what is the name of their political ancestor? Yeah, this one is more difficult. Usually, Geopardy queries are, are ve they have a characteristic that makes them easy. Uh, sometimes, yeah, most of the times to address because they are so specific, so specific that uh, in terms of information retrieval, it becomes very easy. You just use the keywords, which are very specific, uh, and basically you rank the entities associated with that. But yeah, but here they are asking for two things. And this makes the thing more complicated. So, and uh, yeah, the last one is the SEM search challenge, uh, which uh, focuses on, on a, a different problem. So, uh, question answering system, by the definition of the input and output, uh, you have full natural language queries, and the output you have 
uh, post-process direct answers. But uh, a quite related field is called semantic search, uh, which basically, some people have different understandings uh, of semantic search, but from the perspective of this challenge, basically consists in searching over linked data sets uh, for individual, uh, usually, yeah, for entities, for entities over the data set, but not using full natural language queries. That's the only difference. And they also will not uh, have queries which will do operations. So uh, some, uh, give me uh, yeah, the highest, or they will not have this, this kind of queries. So basically, the, the queries look like this, republics of the former Yugoslavia. So classes describing classes uh, of instances, of groups of uh, elements in the database, which is a sub-problem uh, of the question answering system. So it's good if you have a question answering system, you can ev evaluate. Certainly, you need to address this problem, and you can evaluate uh, your question answering system using this data set as well. Uh, they have two tracks. One is the list search, which looks like this, more describing the classes. And then you expect a list of instances, a list of cities, people name. And they have uh, some entity search, what they call entity search queries. Basically, they expect they are, they are more like keyword-based queries. So less interesting from the, the QA perspective. And this year, there is uh, another evaluation campaign. campaign uh, this is the last one, uh, yeah, which it's domain specific. It's not, uh, I believe just the people who registered for the challenge could get the data. So uh, it, it was not clear what was the, what were they exploring because I didn't uh, do this challenge. Uh, but basically it's based on PubMed documents, probably some linked data I didn't put because it was not explicit there, but probably most likely some linked data as well. So BioEsk, uh, good for evaluating domain-specific systems. So yeah. So usually uh, these campaigns are running for a while, so you have baselines uh, to compare as well. But uh, here it's a, a baseline that Belloc, uh, Christian Belloc provided during the last CIR. Uh, for different, so here in the columns you have different evaluation campaigns, and these are very, let's say, uh, standard uh, search-based uh, approaches for each of these campaigns. So it gives you some kind of baseline on how these systems uh, perform uh, in terms of precision. There is just precision. Uh, for if you just took a question answering problem, put into an information retrieval system, applied some state of the art information retrieval techniques, that's the numbers that you get in terms of precision. So 0 0.1 or 0, 0.0 something, close to 0 0.1 most. So uh, low precision. And the recall is not there. Yeah. So good to, to, if you need to answer, okay, why do you do QA? Why don't you do information retrieval? Just information retrieval, you, you can show that. So yeah, uh, if you need to go deeper, if you, uh, there are two very interesting presentations uh, from the last Promise uh, Winter School. I recommend if there is an, another Promise Winter School, if you want to know more about, uh, probably there will not be a Promise, but will be another one. Uh, information retrieval, this is a very, uh, very good uh, school. Uh, so, this is a presentation on, from Tetsuya Sakai. It's the main name uh, on evaluation of information retrieval systems. And the other one is from uh, uh, one of the responsible for the track evaluation. So, how to build a test collection. So, you need uh, to employ some process, some methodology to build that. And uh, this is covered uh, in this presentation. So, just give you some pointers over that. Okay. Uh, any questions about evaluation? Okay, now uh, just going uh, through linked data. So QA has, has an interesting position uh, in terms of uh, the semantic web. 
So QA is part of the semantic web vision. So the main, let's say, popular uh, description of what's expected uh, from the semantic web uh, was became public in an article for the Scientific America by Tim Berners-Lee and yeah, two other authors, uh, which basically says that oh, uh, you want some agents that work for you, you want to interact naturally with these agents, they want to, they should understand what you, your information needs, they should communicate with each other, and basically they were saying that the semantic web infrastructure will enable this kind of agents of uh, intelligent systems. This was back in 2001. And to achieve that, uh, basically the community work towards what's called the cement web stack, uh, which probably you saw in the previous talks, but basically the lower part of the, of the stack are uh, the formats to represent data, and on the top of the stack, you have uh, the logical part of it. So on the lower part, you have just the data itself represented in a standardized way so that everybody can uh, communicate in the same format and or in query this data. And on the top, you have the possibility of doing some reasoning over that. So covering representation and reasoning. But the problem is that when you start working with ontologies and building uh, things that need to be consistent, uh, it's not that straightforward. So the barrier was very high if you need to, to build a, a, an ontology that needs to be consistent for that. And what happens is that uh, basically the cement web vision was based on a very controlled environment, like the one on the left, while the reality of the web was much more messy and chaotic. So, uh, in 2006, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, one of the visionaries uh, of the semantic web, uh, just said, okay, the, the thing on the top is giving too much problem. Let's just transform the web, the semantic web vision, into a huge database vision, right? So, instead of having the reasoning part, uh, let's just take the data out of the databases, so you just triplify, put in a common format, and then we have something, we have part of the plan solved. Uh, which uh, was a, a very important step because people started doing that, and this became, became very uh, popular. Uh, and there, there is a growth for that. But the problem is that when you do that, uh, everything starts to look as a database. So okay, now you have this data, and now you do a very boring query to that, and uh, it takes a lot of time for you to understand what's there, because creating a Sparkle query for LinkedIn is not something that you do fast. You need to understand what's there. And you remove the reasoning part, so the intelligent, the flexible, the, is gone, right? So uh, how should we uh, address that? So that's the vision, that's the reality, and the reality in the end is more painful than that. And this is not for one data set. So you do not know which data set contains your data. So having a, a good way, uh, let's say a usable way to query data at this scale, it's extremely important. So, but, um, but linked data ha has very, I mean, uh, characteristic features that are important anyway. So uh, it's a graph-based data model, which gives you a lot of flexibility to express the things. It uh, has an extensible schema, so you can put whatever you want there on the web. You do not need to ask anybody for permission. And uh, one thing that emerged uh, quite clear is that there is an entity-centric integration method, which is quite efficient. So usually, uh, named entities tend to be less ambiguous, and they are used, named entities like people, name, place, name, uh, and they're used to integrate different data. So uh, in the end, it was a quite successful experiment. And it's, of course, uh, it's, there are other databases which have the features on the top, but linked data has some specific pluses which are very important, which are the standards. So, uh, and uh, it's based on, on the infrastructure of the web as well. So the main negative here 
the main positive part is you have some level of interoperability by the format. Uh, there is no full semantic interoperability, of course. Uh, it's a much more complex problem. And on the negative side, uh, yeah, you have data consumption is one problem. Data generation, how you build your data, this data sets is still uh, a problem. And yeah, linked data is still far from, from the semantic web vision. So QA, uh, now with this scenario, question answering somehow becomes a fundamental part of uh, trying to rescue the semantic web vision. So trying to find, uh, to give the flexibility back to the semantic web uh, over by using linked data. So uh, it's important when you create, uh, especially in a system-oriented area such as, uh, as question answering, it's important to have some common set uh, of requirements if you think from a systems perspective for uh, question answering over linked data. So the first one, uh, I'm just going to go fast through them, uh, is usability, so supporting natural language queries, it's a way to have usability. High expressivity, so you are doing queries over database, you should have the same database expressivity or something uh, not too far. Uh, accurate and comprehensive semantic matching, so there is the vocabulary problem if you are doing natural language queries over linked data, you cannot expect the user to know the vocabulary behind that database, to know the schema, and basically you, you need to have high precision recall on the semantic matching. Low maintainability, so uh, some question answering systems for database uh, are based on manual adaptations. So people get a new data set, they yeah, put the new data set into the system, and they start to build a new lexicon for that. So they put synonyms, they put, uh, yeah, they answer queries, and, but this is a, a very high maintainability effort task. So uh, this is a very important point. It needs to be minimal intervention. So you just take a new data set, put it into your system, and it works. Or you just have very little feedback. So uh, the other one is low query execution time. So the, sh the user should get uh, the query in, in, in a reasonable time, preferably in an interactive time. But maybe this is too much to ask and high scalability. So uh, we're thinking about web scale, right? That's the semantic web vision. So there are some uh, systems. So maybe one, uh, if one stop here, if you want to ask any questions. Okay, perfect. So some uh, question answering systems uh, were developed for linked data. Since uh, prior to 2006, uh, in this case, it's Semantic Web uh, question answering systems. And there are more question answering systems than this list, but I just took some uh, which I consider uh, a good combination of features uh, that we can use to discuss. So uh, the first one uh, is the oldest, it's called uh, Power Aqua. Uh, and the key feature, Power Aqua was one of the first uh, systems to do that. So w usually the first systems try to do the very, let's say, the first naive approach, or, or they, they do some query parsing, they have a search engine, keyword search engine, and yeah, they build a Sparkle query from the query and execute over the search engine. But uh, this was basically the early version of Power Aqua, now uh, Power Aqua adds some more interesting features, which basically uh, it's a word net based similarity. Also it explores the structure of the ontology, uh, classes, taxonomical structure, uh, to do the semantic matching. Also explores string similarity. So Power Aqua starts to uh, work uh, in the direction of a more, let's say, complex terminological matching between user vocabulary and the, the data vocabulary. So uh, initially, Poroaco was not evaluated, uh, does, didn't have any uh, evaluation, uh, was just tested. 
but then in 2011 they did uh, an evaluation of the the system. So I believe most of you should be familiar with WordNet, but basically WordNet is a lexical database which contains, which was manually created, uh, and which is a, a very good resource, but the point is that it's not complete. So if you're thinking about using WordNet for addressing all the vocabulary problems or to do all the semantic matching, you have a very limited solution. So this is one example of a WordNet, uh, let's say, item. And yeah, and uh, this is uh, the similarity matching algorithm or the lines of the algorithm uh, for Power Aqua. So basically, these are the conditions uh, which are based on, on WordNet, basically, and uh, on the ontology as well. I believe here they are not listing the ontology part. They're just listing the, the WordNet part. So yeah, I'm not going to go through the uh, architecture of Power Aqua, but basically what you need to know is that they have a pre-processing approach. They have a semantic matching approach. Uh, yeah, and, and they have a search component. So, and their semantic matching is very heavily based uh, on an algorithm over WordNet and some information available on the taxonomy uh, of the ontology. So uh, there is uh, another system called Oracle, uh, which is developed by Philippe Cimiano in 2007. And the key feature of this system is uh, the, the presence uh, of a, a component which is called, they called Frame Mapper. And what Frame Mapper does is it has a visual interface for people doing lexical engineering. So it's a way to do the manual adaptation and the lexical engineering in the end will give, uh, let's say, the semantic flexibility uh, for, for, for the system. So it doesn't use uh, WordNet as far as I, yeah. And uh, also it uses, uh, as a parsing strategy, uh, logical description grammar. So. Uh, it's an approach which, it's a kind of hybrid approach between uh, a synthetic analysis approach and a semantic representation approach. Uh, yeah, but the main feature of the system is the presence of frame mapper. So you can imagine that a system like this will have uh, a huge adaptation effort. So usually this is feasible for very small data, very simple databases, but if you move to the web scale, this doesn't scale. Uh, but but they developed a nice interface for that. Yeah, they did some evaluation, which was domain specific. So when they didn't reevaluate this. So basically, yeah, that's the, the core components of that. So you usually see the same components over and over again, but the main difference that is the frame mapper uh, interface, which allows the uh, ontology engineering. And that's the frame mapper interface. Basically here, you can visually uh, edit uh, some triple, so the resolution is not good, but it's just saying that uh, an author is someone which has a publication, a publication has a title. So basically you are editing these relationships uh, visually and this allows, uh, let's say, normal non-experts to add knowledge that will be used uh, as a semantic matching approach. So in 2010, uh, uh, Danica, Damlianovich uh, released Freya, and uh, Freya has uh, a, a more interactive uh, way for users to, to, to interact in the question answering system. So it's more introduced uh, an approach which is based on dialogue, right? So every time, at every point uh, on the semantic matching, and for the semantic matching, she uses WordNet and Psych. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure about how she uses psych. It was not clear from, from, the, from the publications. And also string similarity approaches uh, to cope with some uh, vocabulary variations. And it uses the user feedback as well to do that. So every time that the system, for example, finds some ambiguity, uh, for example, uh, what's the population of New York? New York can be a state or can be a city. 
So uh, it has this element that say, okay, did you mean this or that? Uh, and this is the main signature uh, of her system. And for evaluation, uh, she did an evaluation on the Mooney data set, which is a very, let's say, more simple data set. And she did, redid the evaluation for questions of her linked data system. And yeah, basically, that's the component uh, of the system. Very uh, simple architecture, but m more focus on the uh, on the dialogue component where you have the ambiguity and then you have the user disambiguating that. And I, I believe that uh, they extended uh, in another paper this to allow users to uh, enrich uh, the lexicon uh, of, of the system. Okay, there are other interesting QA approaches, more recent for linked data, but I, I'm not going to go over them. So that's usually uh, the face of a QA system. The, the, you have the same components, uh, yeah, and some systems will explore other uh, features. Uh, so I'm going to now uh, describe a more detailed case study, which is based on the system that we did at Derry, which is called TRIO, but the Irish pronunciation is TRO, uh, which means direction. direction. So the key difference in this question answering over linked data space uh, for throw in relation to the other systems uh, is the use of uh, distributional information in the matching process. So uh, and the, we try to uh, uh, create a distributional relational space to somehow uh, organize the ideas on how the approach works. So. Uh, this will become clear uh, later. So in terms of this terminological semantic matching, uh, we use uh, uh, explicit semantic analysis uh, as the distributional model. Uh, the corpus is Wikipedia. Uh, and we use WordNet as well. And uh, also we use some measures uh, of string similarity and node cardinality. So trying to consider which entity in the database is more popular trying to take into account that. And in terms of evaluation, we uh, did the quad 2011 evaluation and we are doing the quad 2012 now <coughs> evaluation. So since this is the case study, the idea is to have a, now a, a more detailed description of the query processing, not too long, but uh, slightly more detailed. So using our query example through the presentation, who is the daughter of Bill Clinton married to, uh, we have the information possibly represented on the linked data web in different ways. So we have a separate uh, corpora, uh, in this case is Wikipedia, where that we will use to build our distribution semantic model. And then uh, with, this is just a, a visual uh, attempt to represent that, uh, we will embed the graph, the linked data graph, the data set into the ESA, uh, vector space, uh, which is a concept of vector space. And this space we call the tau space. Uh, okay, once this is done, this is the indexing part, this is the pre-processing part, uh, the, the thing is ready to get queried. So we do some query analysis uh, step, we extract some features, some patterns from the query. We have a navigational model, uh, which uh, now we have a relational, let's say, model embedded in a distributional space. Now we need some principled way to navigate through the graph into, uh, in the distributional space using the distributional information. That's what we're calling the navigation model. And this is materialized as a query plan, query plan which is a, a set of uh, search operations that uh, we do uh, on the distributional, on the tau space. So basically we are splitting uh, one query answering problem into a set of search operations, search and navigation operations actually, uh, so that we can address the query and then uh, answer the results. So uh, notice that, yeah, you can have the direct answer, 
which the final entry, Mark Mezinski, but uh, to have the justification, uh, it's important to have the justification why this answer was answer like that. And there you have the, yeah, the map. So uh, now going through the steps, try to be quick. So uh, as every question answering system, you have a question analysis step. So starting from the query, <clears throat> we do the post tagging, default uh, stuff. Uh, we do what we call a core entity recognition. So what's this query uh, is about? Uh, which, what is the entity that the query is about? And basically we do, we use the post tag information uh, plus some TF IDF uh, over Wikipedia, uh, which will give us some specificity score. Basically it's, it's not TF IDF, it's IDF. I just have to remove the TF. Uh, we'll give some specificity score to determine if this is probably an instance or probably a class, a property. Uh, so in case there is an instance, we take the instance as the core query. Uh, daughter and married to are properties in this database. And the, good, the important part about taking the instance is that you take the less ambiguous. Uh, there is less probability of having ambiguity in a named entity like Bill Clinton. You may have someone with the same name, but it, it's easier uh, to disambiguate. So somehow you reduce your search space by finding this pivot entity. Uh, then uh, we determine, we do the default stuff, answer type, answer is most likely a person. Uh, we do the dependency parsing, uh, which somehow uh, I consider an, option, uh, an optional uh, step for the approach. Uh, I believe we can replicate that just with the post tagger, which is good to, to transport to other languages, but I didn't do that. So still I use the dependency parsing. And once we have the dependency structure for the query, we uh, build what's called the partial ordered dependency structure, pods. So every QA system will try to build a sparkle-like, a triple-like representation uh, for the query. Uh, and to do that, basically we use uh, the dependencies, the post tags, uh, and we do uh, a rule-based uh, merging and simplification of the query. Remove stop words, uh, reorder the query based on the position of the uh, pivot instance. So we take this as the first entry point into the data set. Again, just uh, taking the most specific parts first and then we reorder obeying the topological constraints of the dependency structure. Uh, after we do that, we classify into probable uh, classes, so uh, instance types. So if it is an instance uh, and predicate, so we have the set of query features, which are going to be used to uh, determine the probable query plan. So the first query plan, the first attack plan for answering the query. So uh, basically, uh, as I already mentioned, query features are used to generate a query plan and a query plan is a sequence of search operations over the tau space uh, search and navigation operations. So basically this uh, instance predicate predicate feature set with the query generates uh, this query plan, this set of steps that we are going to go visually through them. So the first element uh, is instance search for that query plan which here is described more generically as entity search. And the idea of entity search is to search for individual entry points into the data set. So we have a query which has multiple elements, but you need to find an attack point, right? And we are trying to always to make the more specific attack points first. Uh, the entity uh, search strategy tries to, uh, if it's an instance, it's a simpler, so there is no distributional uh, based a search on that. This is a keyword search uh, with some string matching uh, variations plus uh, the node cardinality 
on that. So basically, uh, we have an inverted index with all the uh, with all the entities, so instances, classes, and, and predicates into the data set. We generate a, a separate inverted index for that, and yeah, we just execute uh, as a keyword search. So Bill Clinton there is our keyword search string. And then we have a, a ranked list of URIs. So we found our array into the data set, which is uh, visually represented this way. So on the top you have the query, on the bottom you have the first entity resolved. So then uh, in case there is ambiguity, so in this case there is no ambiguity, let me just simulate that there is ambiguity. So suppose there is a, a Bill Clinton which is an actor. Uh, we use uh, ESA, so uh, to compute the semantic relatedness between the entity types, so and uh, and and the entity. It's so there is yes yes and the entity itself. So just trying to find what's the most uh, likely uh, answer for that from the distributional perspective. But this is not conclusive. So uh, uh, we use just as, as a kind of ranking, uh, additional ranking operator, and then we generate a set of facets for users to disambiguate. So as in the Freya system that I showed, uh, it's, it's unavoidable that you need uh, to disambiguate and you need some output to do that. So, but in this case, there is no ambiguity. Uh, and then also we have what's called the pivot entity. We have this pivot, so we reduced our set space. We are just looking for things related to Bill Clinton. We are not looking at the data set as a whole anymore. Right, so uh, now we have this constraint. We go to the next query term, which is daughter, and we compute the semantic relatedness using ESA uh, between daughter and child. Uh, between, sorry, daughter and all the properties and ranges uh, of uh, Bill Clinton. So basically we are trying to use the distributional model to select in which direction we go in the graph for the semantic matching. What's the next constraint? And since they have different vocabularies, the distributional model is a fundamental part for that. Uh, yeah, and if you look at the values of the ESA, you have the semantic matching now for child. Now you navigate through the next uh, entity, which is Chelsea. Uh, yeah, just this, this is probably uh, already covered from the previous um, talk in the morning. Uh, so what's uh, distributional models and how semantic relations can be computed from distributional model, so I'll just go through over that. But the main advantage is that you can take a huge, uh, let's say, unstructured knowledge base and use as a common sense reasoning engine. If you can convert your operations into semantic related operations, and that's exactly what we, we do here. So basically, uh, it's a way to determine that daughter is uh, strongly related to child. Yeah, and now we have a new pivot entity. We do the same process for Mary Chu and for the relations of Chelsea Clinton. And then in the end, we end with Mark Mezinski. So this is how uh, the results look like on the interface. So that's, uh, we have, uh, it's not a, a let's say, 100% precision query mechanism. This is not expected by the distributional model. So it's what's called a semantic best effort. But this reduces dramatically the output uh, that we have uh, from the original query set. So it's a very narrow uh, answer set. And uh, depending on the query, we may have a, a post-processing operation that I didn't describe it. So for example, a yes no query like was Margaret Thatcher a chemist? She was. Uh, we have a set of queries which are the justification for the answer, and then uh, we have the short answer, yes. So just going briefly as well uh, through the second query example, 
what's the highest mountain? In this case, we do not have a name in the entity. We have a generic class called mountain. And the query pattern that we derive from the query analysis is different. So there's a class with an operator. So basically, we start with the class mountain. We take all the instances uh, inside the data set. In this case, we are using a real data set for the Bipedia, so our, around 55,000 mountains. Uh, and for each of them, uh, we take a super set of all of their properties. So the properties may vary. We sample uh, into sample specific instances and get a super set of properties. And then we use, again, semantic relatedness, distribution semantic relatedness to try to compute uh, the relationship. What's between the operator, so highest is one operator, and uh, the property that we have there. So what's most likely to occur with highest there? Uh, in this case, the semantic matching works fine. Uh, in case there is ambiguity, so multiple things returned. There is a, a disambiguation dialog that returns, so that the user can say, okay, I mean elevation, not something else. Uh, and then, basically, we apply the functional definition of the operator. So we sort uh, all the elevation, all the instances by elevation, and then we get the topmost. And that's uh, an actual result for that. So uh, throw, there is a prototype, a working prototype. I will show some queries running. Uh, yeah, and that's the, the interface of the system. So as I mentioned, it's not expected to, to be a 100% a perfect QE system. Uh, it should, we have the fallback somehow, the fallback strategy uh, of uh, in case we cannot, for example, post-process the query and find the exact answer, we just provide the support in triples for that. It, it works in this case as a semantic search engine or natural language interface. So, and it's very important uh, that somehow uh, you tolerate. This is a very hard problem, and you should provide somehow the mechanism to support your QA system uh, to learn, right? So the disambiguation dialogues work like that, right? And uh, you shouldn't expect too much as well uh, in terms of you shouldn't expect 100% precise answers. So uh, this is something related to the big data scenario. We cannot. Uh, expect that in the big data scenario we have perfect things running out. So there are other types of user feedback. So if you have an answer set for this query, give me all actors starting uh, in bottom and begins. Uh, we can say, for example, we can mark that someone is not an actor, shouldn't be there. Uh, or, or this specific triple is not important. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm just leaving this as a reference. These are the, the core components of the throw uh, architecture. Uh, one important thing, so to have uh, scalability, so we are talking about huge data sets. Uh, DBpedia has 17 gigabytes of data, DBpedia plus Iago, uh, probably now slightly more. And yeah, um, potentially, it's a very complex schema. So you need to have scalable approach to have performance. And basically, we created an index structure. So basically, we instantiated this as a Lucene index. Uh, we instantiated the tau space, that distributional model part, uh, as a Lucene index, so that uh, you can have uh, an index that doesn't grow dramatically in terms of size, or in, uh, doesn't grow in terms of query performance uh, time. So I'm just leaving here as a reference in case you want to take Careful look, the slides will be available. So yeah, somehow uh, uh, the core uh, characteristics of Troll, it's a hybrid model. It uses elements from databases, information retrieval, and question answering. So information retrieval somehow is a, is a fallback from that. It gives ranked query results. So in case we cannot go to a direct answer, it will provide us the triples that are supporting the database. Uh, and it has uh, a distributional vector space model for uh, representing the data, the relational data. So uh, it's a very similar motivation to the, the core, uh, Trevor Cohen uh, predication space. Uh, 
but basically, we are not uh, trying to define a distributional model in the sense that usually people build the distributional model. So we are trying to decouple a little bit more so that we can have a navigation, a set of navigation operators on this relational space. So we, we are calling this, uh, this tau space we also call a distributional relational network so that you can have somehow the distributional model align it uh, to, the, to the relational network. And the distribution of semantic relations is a primitive operation for the, the query matching. So just showing the thing running, simple queries before we have the stop. Oops. Just, I wanted to stop, but. Uh, mm -mm. So you have some queries with uh, examples of query from vocabulary gap, so tall to height. Founded formation year. Admitted admittance, owner key person. Profession occupation. Dialects approximated to language. Right author but with some noisy data as well. And the Margaret Thatcher query. So this is uh, approximately uh, the query response. It's a little bit accelerated for some reason, for, for some reason, but uh, yeah, but not too much. So uh, it, it works quite, I mean, in terms of performance, it works okay. So more complex query, so which have operations of give me all cities in New Jersey with more than something habitant, inhabitants. You have the justification below and the short answer there. And what's the highest mountain? This, this query takes a while, which, because you need basically to, to go through all the mountains. Just sample, yeah, very space. I believe I, I have no bar to accelerate here. It's good to, that you have a, a realistic picture of the Okay. That's it. So one uh, operation also that's important that comes, let's say, freely with this is the ability to search the vocabulary, such vocabulary. So in linked data, it's very important to reuse existing vocabularies and search which concepts are already there. So for example, if I'm building an application for an oil and gas company, and then I want to discover data sets which are related to geology, which are very important for their domain. So somehow uh, I need to, to, to explore that, but keyword search doesn't work as well. So yeah, this is using ESA as well, just for searching for vocabulary. So geology, you have returning Lithology, morphology, tectonic, mineral, formation. There is another bath, the instrument. So, guitar, singer, guest, yes. Can be used for, for vocabulary. So, so, we did also a variation of the system, now taking into account uh, Wikipedia. Uh, unstructured data. So this is DBpedia, Yago, and Wikipedia as data sources. Two structured, one unstructured. So we are taking queries, questions from the Geopardy challenge, which are that long. Some speculate this, blah, blah, blah. So these are what's on like Yeah, the prices should reflect the difference. It's not always the case uh, for, from the information which you offer. This is now the last one.
no, uh, yeah, now is the last one. The most difficult. Most difficult. For him, was at least. So usually, this, this is the face of uh, Jeopardy queries. So you have a description, and then it returns a, an instance. So it's not difficult to, to address that. But uh, yeah. Something was frozen here. So, but it, I was planning to stop anyway. <laughs> so, for the last part. So, what time, Pierre Paul? Is it? First of all, this was quite impressive. I think everything is uh, thinking the same thing. But um, the first part of the system, the one that do, does the, 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 analyze of, uh, the analysis of, of the question and also the, um, uh, construct the plan, I don't know if I'm using the right words, but the plan for the query, um, I think that they are um, uh, more, uh, mostly rule-based systems. And so, um, uh, I cannot, uh, um, can you give us some more insights on how does these rules work? For example, if there are rules based, based on uh, just the words appearing or um, uh, the, other the, other, uh, the outputs of the other analysis done previously or something like that? So, from the linked data perspective, if you think about question answering in general, you get the impression that uh, things are extremely complicated and uh, uh, so the facility on having actually serializing the concept of vectors I believe this is not uh, a justification for that uh, yeah probably the fa it was easy for us compared to other methods with the resources that we had to process Wikipedia, let's say, volume of data that we need to have a more comprehensive approach. Uh, it gives good results from the start for the type of queries that we were evaluating the system. But I consider this, I do not consider this as a final solution. So I think that, I'm not sure that I agree, uh, good to compute uh, the relatedness between instances and not good to predicate. I would put it in another in other terms, but certainly ESA is not a complete model to address this problem. Uh, so, and we do not see that. So, what we expect is that uh, ESA is still going to be there uh, to address some parts of the semantic matching, but we consider the final solution to have a composition of different approaches which have complementary aspects with ESA. So to answer, ESA was a starting point. Uh, it worked well. Uh, somehow it was a lucky starting point for the problem that we are addressing, but we are already facing the limitations of, of ESA for some of the queries, and we should try to complement uh, with other distributional models. Questions? No? Um, what um, in, in, what are the, 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 the let's say the the harder questions for the, the for for for, your, for this kind of system? Uh, like wh wh where it gets get get it wrong? Uh, so the the harder question the short answer is the harder questions are the questions which we have uh, the probability of more variations in the data representation. So usually if you want to express uh, a very constrained, so you have a set which is presidents of the United States, right? This represents a class. And then you have presidents of the United States that lived between this and that. 
and maybe you can add, uh, let's say, Californian presidents of the. So uh, when you add these constraints, you somehow uh, ex expands a lot the possibility of the query plan because this can have combinations of, in terms of representation between classes, predicates with values, and this can be in one class as well. So uh, these are the harder questions. So um, somehow, sometimes, uh, a lot of the times we get right because the question is so specific that uh, somehow this specificity solves itself. But when we have a vocabulary variation plus this, let's say, compositional variation uh, or structural, possibility of structural variation, that's the harder question for specifying, let's say, very specific sets. Did I? OK. Sorry? Very nice system. <laughs> Good, thanks. Fanno <laughs> economy. Uh, that's the performance of the system. Uh, so in terms of precision, uh, that, that's equivalent to the second best performance city system. Uh, but in terms of numbers uh, of answered queries and average recall is quite high. So there are two explanations for that. One is the distributional model supporting more flexible matching. The other one uh, is a more, let's say, uh, principled uh, and uh, query strategy, uh, query planning strategy. So most of the systems uh, perform poorly on complex queries. So operations, uh, superlatives, uh, questions like this. So uh, it's very important to have this kind of uh, principled uh, query plan to address this kind of query. So this is the evaluation of the components. I'm, I'm just going to skip off the slides. And yeah, these are the other evaluation metrics, query execution time, indexing time. Just to show you that uh, uh, this evaluation is there. So in terms of execution time, it's quite fast. Uh, it is scalable uh, by the construction of the index. It is, it is very scalable. Uh, adaptation effort due to the distributional model. So no lexical engineering uh, was done in, in this specific evaluation here. But somehow the user feedback is an adaptation effort, but during the query processing. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to skip because, uh, OK. Okay, so uh, one thing that uh, I would like, just from, from my practical experience in building the system, uh, I think it's important to give some very concrete pointers, so in terms of resources. So uh, maybe it's obvious for most of you, but uh, yeah. So 95% of Jeopardy answers are, are answerable by Wikipedia. So this shows the v how broad Wikipedia is. And... Uh, and Wikipedia is a, very, it's a, it's a very powerful resource. So if you have a problem and if you need a large common sense mechanism, uh, Wikipedia is, is a very important resource to, to look at. And uh, it, one of the good things about Wikipedia is that they have structured data 
uh, associated with that. So DBpedia uh, and Iago are very, also very interesting uh, data sets if you want to use it as a knowledge base as well. So I I'm just going to, to give you some pointers from the resources that I experimented, uh, being them data sets, uh, which ones I, I considered quite interesting to use. So this is the type of information that is expressed in Yago. So very complex specification of queries and every, of, sorry, of classes. And every class like this has the set of instances that they contain. So uh, fourth century Greek people mapping to all the fourth century Greek people in uh, Wikipedia. So uh, very interesting thing. So this is the obvious uh, thing, WordNet and Wiktionary. Uh, parser, uh, very use, easy to use parser tools. Uh, so from the dependency parsing and the post tag, uh, we do not have, most of our problems are, are outside the scope of the parsers. So Stanford parser attended very well, uh, at least for, for our use case, right, which is very uh, restricted. So uh, name identity recognition, uh, we developed our own name identity recognition for this problem. Uh, we are going to open source it. DBPD Spotlight uh, is a very good name identity recognition slash resolution system. Basically, we are going to generate an equivalent to, to, uh, to Spotlight because it's already there. So in terms of uh, search engines frameworks, very obvious recommendation, but uh, from some experience, Lucene is amazing as an information retrieval framework. Gives a lot of flexibility to do that. I wouldn't consider that you can use Lucene as a database, basically the core of the implementation of the, the tau space uh, is uh, developing Lucene. Uh, we are going to make throw tau space, which is the core, let's say, semantic uh, matching component with the distributional uh, model available, uh, as well with the explicit semantic analysis implementation, which is good performance as well, because it's based on, on uh, big data, uh, NoSQL databases and also through entity search. So uh, I'm just listing that because these resources should be available soon. And in case you have any interest, just uh, I'm just waiting some approval from the university to do that. Yeah, so just going quickly through that. Okay. So uh, I'm just listing here quickly what I consider some hot topics for this area, specifically linked data question answering over linked data. So one thing is trying to uh, have queries which demand extraction uh, of graphs, of linked data graphs from text. Uh, the motivation for this is obvious. So this is what the BPD contains. This is also for the article Barack Obama, uh, what is there, right? So there is a lot of information that we, we can explore. And one approach is to try to do the extraction of the graphs and then answer the graphs over linked data. So uh, we developed a prototype in this direction which is called Graphia, uh, which extracts some graphs from, from DBpedia, so very simple graphs. And, but we didn't do the process of uh, trying to evaluate these graphs in terms of query answering, question answering. So these are more complex graphs. So this is kind of relation extraction, but uh, we are trying to Usually relation extraction, we extract triples, but usually sentences contain much more complex relationships and contextual relationships, dependencies. So this is a, an example of a project which is complementary to throw. These are examples of Wikipedia graphs extracted from natural language. So this is the first. Uh, the second, uh, to explore more complex uh, dialogue context and to reflect this on the evaluation. So having uh, the capture of the context uh, of a conversational agent uh, and having this disambiguation needed for some of the tasks. Uh, the third topic 
uh, advance the use of distribution semantic models on QA. Though, so this is far from being uh, fully explored. Uh, fourth, provide incentives for people publishing open source robust, solid uh, software and data. So there is uh, one initiative called Altimetrics, which basically will try to uh, give the incentives to people to collect, uh, to be judged or evaluated not only by publications and citations, but also by this kind of contribution. So, and this is very much needed in a very multi-dimensional field. Multilingual QA is just starting. Uh, there is some evaluation task there. Creation uh, of multi-sourced, more complex source test collections. Uh, integration of reasoning. So this is more long term, very long term, but probably one of the very interesting. But yeah, we, we have time. <laughs> we, have, we have time. We have 30 years to <laughs> at least. Let's see. Uh, okay, and development of uh, QA approach and tasks which used both structured and structured data. So by doing the, the merge between, by trying to address the jeopardy queries, it becomes very uh, clear uh, how much this marriage between structure and the structured data could benefit, I mean, users of real applications. So uh, a search engine uh, just over Wikipedia and DBpedia working well over these two data sets uh, is a, a very important resource in itself. It's usable, it's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, okay, just uh, last part, maybe we can interrupt, but uh, one, it depends on, on the, yeah, on the nature of the audience. So how much time do we have? Five minutes, okay. We just, uh, yeah, I believe we have Okay, no, just to have more five minutes for questions, but yeah, but in five minutes, okay, we can finish that. So uh, this was intended to put here because in case there were some industry or developers, open source developers uh, around, but just to give the experience based on the construction of QA system, there are a lot of patterns that you get from the experience that you didn't have before. So uh, it's interesting because most of the barrier for building this kind of system is cultural at this point. It's not really about uh, principles and technologies and yeah, just people are not used to the things that we are. Basically, uh, the first pattern is try to maximize the amount of knowledge in your semantic application. Use unstructured knowledge, use open data sets. There are a lot of resources that you can use to that. The second is uh, allow your databases to grow so use NoSQL, uh, use flexible uh, databases and do not get paranoid uh, about their schema. So uh, this is, the idea is to derive some patterns that can be used to, to build semantic application. So once you have this environment where everything is messy, uh, you can use semantic search instead of structured queries, so be flexible. Uh, this will work quite well. There are great search engines. Uh, even simple keyword search will work for a while for simple queries. Uh, use distribution semantics uh, and semantic relatives for uh, robust, I would say comprehensive instead of robust semantic matching. So yeah, uh, yeah taggers, uh, parsers are very mature as I already mentioned and Parsing plus rules will, all, it will go a long way uh, in the process of allowing your application to interpret natural language. So uh, provide a user feedback mechanism, record this user feedback mechanism. Do not have unrealistic expectations on that. So this is the final slide, last. <laughs> so, uh, Okay, the, take, the takeaway message that uh, I want you to take, to go home and with these messages, uh, first, uh, it's necessary to have new principled uh, semantic approach to cope with big data, and these approaches are not there. So the uh, database community, for example, is very far uh, for, 
from having this uh, addressed. There is a nice research opportunity here. Uh, information from, from an applied perspective, uh, information systems will heavily be based on this kind of things that we are investigated, investigating. There are some resources which are mature that can be used, so do not uh, wait too much until <laughs> someone in Silicon Valley do this, do it in body. So, uh, yeah, and part of the cement web vision that intelligent agents, uh, it's already uh, mature, uh, can be implemented by the technologies which are already here today. So, but this depends on a multidisciplinary vision. So you need to take cement web resources, uh, information retrieval principles and approaches, natural language processing and merge everything into a single space. So, yeah, in case you, you are into developing, you can build your own I, IBM Watson-like application. This is not something from yeah, another planet. And, yeah, everything is available to use. Uh, yeah, the main barrier is the mindset. A huge opportunity for new solutions. Do it in body. So, <laughs> just to, to finish, uh, Derry is a cement web research institute. Uh, in Ireland, Goy, Ireland. Goy is a very nice city. Rainy, but very nice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, everybody loves Goy, except for the rain. So, and if you are an uh, advanced undergraduate, undergraduate student or master's or PhD, there are always uh, internships available. There, if you have interest in going for, uh, to Ireland for a while, uh, just send me your, your CV, or forward to the people. Uh, if you want to work on similar things, related things. And yeah, I'm also helping some uh, to create uh, a lab in Brazil, so Rio de Janeiro. So if you also want to go there, there are, these are more senior positions, so postdoc and even professor. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. positions that can even be conciliated being here and there. So if you have interest in that, just uh, let me know. There are some topic freedom to, to do research, yeah. not too concerned by projects. So feel free to contact me. These are my contact venues, things. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much for your interesting <laughs> talk. We have time for just a few questions. <laughs> Thanks again, the speaker. Okay. Uh, for tomorrow, um, the lesson is at the faculty of languages <laughs> yes and it's uh, aula due no aula otto secondo piano so um, we will put some arrows in the in the in the building to help you but no, don't be scared it, it's dungeon but you can manage to find the, the room